some of the other things that I like to ask the guests. Uh, previously, I have asked guests about the, their opinion about these so-called interpretations of quantum physics. Uh, there's this thing that's called the measure problem, I believe. I don't know, do you have a strong opinion about this? Because, I mean, uh, so, what I find so far from the people that I have spoken with, some people don't seem to even care. Some people, it's not important, this problem, they don't seem to think about this whole interpretation. Oh, they care, they care, just they don't know what to say. That's the problem. But I don't know. Yeah, so, so uh, two years ago, myself and Arthur Eckert, whom I mentioned, uh, we wrote a paper about uh, a possible s solution to, the pr to some of the problems of the quantum theory, at least uh, not maybe solving the problems, but understanding better the origin of quantum theory. So... We began this conversation by talking about how the electron behaves, that it behaves unpredictably, it's not fundamentally deterministic, it behaves as if it was moving along multiple paths at the same time. It just falls, falls after the blow. You, you don't know what's the reason for this. And Feynman in his textbook uh, writes about this and says that nobody knows whether there's some gears and wheels inside, nobody knows any deeper explanation of this. It's just the way it is, that's the rule, and we have no ideas where does it come from. So. So we, myself and Arthur wrote this paper that could be summarized by saying, uh, challenge accepted. Uh, so um, we, uh, we propose how, what could be the origin of this? And this has to do with the remark I made before that there is this weird connection between relativity and quantum theory. We have two different theories that somehow seem to know something about each other. Like quantum theory does exactly what it can and not more, not to piece off, you know, relativi relativistic structures. Uh, so. We, the, the, the starting point that we observed is that uh, when you talk about relativity, there is this uh, limitation of the speed of light that you cannot exceed, because if you could introduce um, observers that move faster than light or particles that move faster than light, some weird, happen, weird things would happen. The, you'd have problems with causality, perhaps you would have a grandfather paradox, you could go back to the future and such. For that reason, nobody seriously takes that into account. So our paper is to explore the question, what would happen if you would allow supernova particles and supernova <coughs> phrase of reference? And it turns out that it is true that causality is affected, but it turns out that you do not run into serious paradoxes. You don't have a grandfather paradox at all, which is a surprise. The causality is disturbed, but it seems to be disturbed exactly the way that we know from quantum, from quantum theory. So it turns out that if you, that first of all, you can fully extend special relativity to account for supernova frames of reference and particles. You have full dynamics for, for kinematics of that. You could have these objects interact with our objects if they existed. Nobody knows if they exist or not. Uh, and the price you would pay is that no classical physics would be possible. You would have to have some sort of disturbance of causality and we have found that fundamental unpredictability of outcomes would be a must. That situations where particles move along multiple paths at the same time is a must. You cannot prevent that. Also, it turns out that uh, in order to characterize motions along uh, two points along multiple paths, you would need to use complex numbers. And the formalism that, right, that kind of emerges looks like the formalism that we know from quantum theory. So the claim of the paper was that you can in fact explain uh, these fundamental postulates of quantum theory, the unpredictability, superpositions, and, and such, by extending principle for relati by extending special relativity to account for supernova observers. And the funny bit is that in what you normally do is you, when you derive relativity, you assume that all inertia frames are equal. Uh, you can postulate that speed of light is preserved. You don't have to, but it's possible. And then you derive Florence transformations that are limited by speed of light. You cannot go faster than light. But there always is a second solution, mathematically allows second solution that allows for transformations that involve the superlinear speeds, and uh, you just uh, reject that solution as unphysical. And then you build quantum theory on your own. Uh, what we have shown is that if you don't reject the second family of solutions, just treat it equally, you keep all that maths allows you to keep, then you get something that looks like a quantum theory. And uh, we, we wrote uh, two papers about this. Uh, that kind of seemed to be uh, really puzzling to many people. And we are now working on a, a quantum field theory extension of this. So uh, the, my, my understanding is that, first of all, quantum theory is not that surprising anymore. 
that it turns out to be a consequence of a very, very fundamental um, fact that all frames are equal. And that does include superlinear frames of reference. And if you take that point of view, many mysteries are not so mysterious anymore. Okay. Okay, but because um, from what I told with other uh, quantum physicists, some of, some of it, the problem, or what they think it's a problem, is this thing, um, like, as far as I understand, no one really knows exactly how or when exactly does a collapse happens. It's just something that happens. So, and I mean, you see many, for some people crazy, for some people very serious, like, I don't know, this whole many world interpretation or stuff like that. Is this something you take seriously or not? Or I don't know. Okay, first of all, I don't see any evidence of having to talk about collapse at all. Uh, so people use that concept a lot. Mm -hmm. It can be practic practically useful for some applications, mm -hmm. but the fact is that you can explain every single experiment that I'm aware of without using the concept of a collapse. At least not as a physical process that changes, changes a cloud of of, of, of something in, in space. You can understand collapse as the change of your amount of knowledge in your head about the quantum system, yet if you learn something, that's a collapse in a way, because you learn something, so your state of knowledge has changed. Okay. In that sense, the, the notion of collapse makes some sense. However, to me, it makes no sense whatsoever uh, when you think of it as a change of a physical structure that happens in space, like the wave function changes its shape. This doesn't happen. I, I don't think there's a reason to even use that concept. And I think I can explain every single experiment that seems to indicate the presence of a collapse with with an interpretation that has no collapse whatsoever. So I, I think this, this, this notion of collapse is a bit overrated and it's overhyped. I don't think there is anything interesting there to me. But it is the standard interpretation. It's, it's a one of the it's one of possible uh, explanation or I mean, descriptions of what happens, right? On the other hand, you have uh, this many word interpretation, and to me, it's not really an interpretation. So the question is whether quantum systems, well, whether quantum theory applies only to microscopical systems, mm -hmm. or does it also apply to macroscopical systems as us, mm -hmm. books, humans, uh, rooms, cameras? Is this also quantum or not? If everything is quantum and everything is characterized by Schrodinger equation of some sort, if quantum theory has no limits in the macroscopical direction, that means that we have to follow exactly the same rules as the electron follows, which means that we have to be at several places at the same time. You have to run through several scenarios at once. This is not an interpretation. This is just a fact. If quantum theory holds for macroscopical systems, it is a fact that we live in just one of the branches and through a very complex interference, we maybe see these effects are not that effects, but it has to be this way. It's not an interpretation. Now, if quantum theory is not true and it's only approximation in the microscopic in the microscopical scales and it just fails to be correct in our scales for some reason, maybe because of gravity or something else that we don't understand, then it just doesn't work and we don't have to worry about many words. So there is no instance where many words is an interpretation. It's either the fact or it's just uh, a wrong. If, if it's a fact, then, then uh, that means that quantum theory holds for large scales. If it doesn't hold for large scales, we have something else and there is no multi multiverse of that kind. So uh, I don't find this to be an interpretation. I just find to be a consequence of, of a question whether quantum th what are the limits of quantum theory. Okay, but I mean, I mean, I guess some people will disagree. I mean, some people will even call it a, a scientific idea in the sense that, I mean, if there are these worlds, I mean, if they cannot be observed or measured or whatever, then it's not saying, it, it ends up being very something speculative that... Uh, maybe maybe this is true that uh, this is not testable. Maybe that is even true. Some, I mean, David Deutsch thinks that some variants of, of that idea is testable. Maybe it's not. But then I'm just saying that if quantum theory holds... The way we understand quantum theory for electrons, it also holds for humans. That's a fact that we are living in just one of the branches. If it is not testable, that means that science is not good enough to understand our reality. Maybe you have to go beyond this somehow. I don't know. But this is not an argument. If, if something is not testable, then this cannot be true. Yes, it is possible that some aspects of reality are not testable, at least not for us, not today. Who knows? I'm just saying that if quantum theory is correct, there is no other ex explanation. There is no other way to go. We just have to state that superpositions characterize not only electrons but everything else. That's the structure of quantum theory. So, I don't see how that would be uh, an interpretation in any scenario. Okay, I see. I mean, maybe not an interpretation, but I mean, I, 
my friend says that I guess there is the possibility that also some kind of new idea that explains this phenomenon that is not a that is not it. Oh yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, I'm just I'm just saying that if some if some if something changes in our understanding of quantum theory, for example, we got it wrong all the time, or maybe it breaks down because of gravity on large scales. Who knows? Then yeah, then then we have to modify everything else. But as long as quantum theory is the the way to go, which is the present stage. We have no better theory. And uh, in fact, my work with Arthur makes me believe, or I don't want to use the word believe, but makes me suspect or, or makes it more probable that the quantum theory is the way to go, simply because uh, we show that if you start with this fully extended principle of relativity that allows all obs observers to be fully equal, then fundamental unpredictability is a must. You you can just, in a very simple terms, show that uh, reality cannot be deterministic. You can show that uh, objects cannot move along single paths. They have to move along multiple paths. Uh, you get complex numbers. Uh, you get all the other stuff as well. It's getting really interested there. So so in a way, if I if we if you want to believe in principle of relativity, that is a very simple principle. Galileo already found it that if you go with a constant speed, laws of physics are the same. This simple idea leads to the discovery of relativity. You can derive relativity with just this idea. There you find that there must exist a certain constant that you can call, call the speed of light. Uh, you don't know the value of the constant, but you can derive the fact that there must be a constant of some value. And from there, if you keep both mathematical solutions, you get all these facts about quantum theory that you have in determinism, you have superpositions and, and such. So it's hard for me to understand. I mean, if you don't, if something breaks down in quantum theory, that means that something would have to be incorrect in the principle of relativity, which perhaps is some sort of a approximation. Maybe on the Planck scale, it's not true anymore, uh, and therefore Planck scale modifies physics of of the quantum theory. But uh, if you don't go that far, it seems that uh, uh, the only way to prevent uh, parallel universes or or this average interpretation is to say that quantum theory simply has to break down at large scales. I see. Okay, well.